Thanks, Haley. And since this is the last panel, I'd like to take 30 seconds and just say thank you to Reuters and especially to Haley. Because when we were first asked to do this, it was February, and we were going to do it live and in person in Detroit. And as all of us know, that is not going to happen anytime soon. So they have taken everything, coordinated it through all, the year, all of the year, and we are now doing this via Zoom to, for the future of car design. So welcome all, all of you to the Car Design Forum. I'd like my guests to introduce themselves as I say their name. First, Henrik Fisker. Hi, Lou. Uh, Henrik Fisker. I'm the Chairman, CEO, and Design Chief at Fisker Inc. Wonderful. And Dave Merrick. Morning, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Dave Merrick. I'm the Executive Creative Director for Acura. Perfect. Stefan Seeloff. Hello, good afternoon, everybody from the north of England, from Crewe, the Bentley headquarters. I'm design director of Bentley. And uh, Andrew Smith. Hi, everybody. I'm Andrew Smith. I'm the executive director of design for Cadillac here at GM's Tech Center in Warren, Michigan. And I'd just like to uh, also invite, uh, uh, say thank you to all of the 50 design students that are, have joined us as well. So before the pandemic, each one of you were traveling to your global design centers to create cars. How has the virtual designing changed the process? And what will you take away from this design for the future? Any of you just go right ahead and start. Uh, sure. I, yeah, um, yeah, for me, uh, you know, my most of my travel is Japan, but also China. So obviously China is hit pretty hard. But um, I think that you, the question is, how are we coping with looking at like full size models like you see behind me? Um, it's really unusual, I guess. The easy answer is that, you know, through uh, Skype or through Microsoft Teams or through Zoom, um, we're able to kind of video the car, but the, the easiest way is to have a, a similar car milled here that's milled in Japan or milled in China. And then you, you look at it and work on it during the day and then you send it to Japan or China and then they mill it overnight and then during the day they work on it. So there's kind of almost, it's, it's, it's bad, don't get me wrong, but in, in the scheme of things, it's almost like a 24 hour factory that you're working on these stylings. So I think in some ways we've learned a lot on how to expedite things or, or streamline, but also there's no, um, there's, there's no way to not look at it in person. You have to, you have to look at it in person. And I, I you know, maybe you guys want to chime in now because I, I found yeah. that it. Stephen, I saw you with your hand up. Yeah, yeah, thank you. No, um, Haley, I totally agree on this, uh, on the side when we talk about meetings and I'm, as you know, with Bentley in the, integrated in the Volkswagen group operating worldwide. So we have meetings with all kinds of colleagues in Germany, all over the world, also with the group design directors, which is sometimes quite good because we don't have to travel, but as we are all, all over here and also a lot in the uh, members in the audience, we are all um, designer from the artistic point of view. And we are now in the lockdown since um, March, more or less, more or less, but uh, we never came back to a creative flow. And this is uh, for us designer, I would say the, the worst scenario. You, ha you need to have this, this momentum in the studio where you are having like a jazz band, you have a little, a, a little bit of a, a jam session. Sometimes it's mixed with humor. And these things are not happening on the, on the, on the virtual meetings. You, 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 are not, you are not having a jam session. No jazz band in the world can have a jam session on Zoom or on uh, Microsoft Teams. It doesn't work. And this is something where I'm really, really getting uh, concerned because it's a challenge to keep the team uh, under creative power and to have the output in the end. Yeah. Right. Hey, I Andrew, guess, uh, how are you guys doing? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I agree with both Stefan and Dave um, in that 
without um, having relationships with people before the pandemic, I think it would be impossible. The fact that we all know each other so well means that at least as we're talking on, on electronic media, we, we know each other so we can kind of, um, you know, already connect. Um, we've been doing a lot of work here with head, head mounted displays or HMD units. Um, and mostly, I guess the pandemic has forced us to use them in the past. We didn't really want to use them so much, but we're using them more than we ever have and doing virtual reviews. And they, they don't get you 100% of the way there, but they certainly get you closer. Um, and I think um, it's been quite helpful. And I think to Dave's point as well, the fact that suddenly you're working 24 hours a day, you know, handoffs and, and studios running around the world constantly, I think has been um, an interesting change that I wouldn't have predicted. Henrik, you're not only the uh, chief car designer, you're the CEO of the company. It's, it's got to be interesting, at least for you. Well, you know, for us, it's probably a little easier because we don't have design studios all over the world. <laughs> We're just here in California, which makes it somewhat easier. But I would say we have hired about, not only in design, but probably about 60, 70 people during COVID. And probably at least 50 of them I haven't even seen yet. I mean, in real life, which is kind of strange. Um, and I agree with everybody. Look, I, I, I'm such a proponent on seeing full-size models, clay models. This is where for me the magic really happens. Yeah. We were just lucky actually that we had signed off our design just before COVID started. So since then it's mainly been work as we all know anyway, happening digitally. Uh, but we just milled out uh, a, a vehicle here for final sort of review, and I was able to go and see it. We have taken all the right precautions. We're a small team. We don't have to travel. So that has made it easier for us. But I think the big learnings for me has been that we can probably in the future do a lot more without necessarily having to travel. Uh, you know, I think we've been really good at, at getting Zoom meetings or whatever meeting going, uh, but there's no doubt as a creative person, you, you you know, and it doesn't even matter if it's just design. I even think engineering, it doesn't matter. You just innovate much more when you're together with other people. You just can't sit and do that at home at all. You know, the car is actually an impulse buying car. It's one of the highest reasons that a person will actually purchase their car. How do you design now for impulse buying, especially with COVID? Well, Maybe I can start on that one. So we, we kind of started out already last year with a vision of being a digital car company. And it kind of, um, I would say, accelerated during COVID where I got to be honest, I never bought a pair of shoes uh, online before, but I did it during COVID, you know, so, and, and I needed a pair of new running shoes and it worked. And then you suddenly get used to it. And my view is in the future, people's going to feel fine to, to buy a, a car online and, you know, you still want to go and see it. So you're going to have to go somewhere and see that vehicle for sure. Uh, but I think we're going uh, fully digital when it comes to interacting with, with customers. In our case, we build our own uh, app, which uh, we already have pretty much uh, most of, I mean, all our orders are coming online or from the app. It's just the way it is. And, and uh, I think this is going to take off in a much stronger way in the future, in my view. But, you know, a car it's an emotional piece of sculpture and at the end of the day, you want to go and see it somewhere, whether that's an experience end or a dealership or whether somebody brings it. I mean, you, you know, that, that's something that I, we're not going to go away from for sure. I, I totally agree with that. I think that um, it is an interesting um, challenge that you're designing one of the most expensive products that a person will ever buy. And to your point, it really is all about the impulse and about the emotion. I think that unless they can see it in, in the flesh, it's, it's a little different to the, to the pair of shoes that you do want to touch it and, and know that's the vehicle that you want. I think you can use configurators and, and um, you know, um, online tools to, to configure the vehicle you're looking for. But at the end of the day, you do want to always kind of see it and confirm that that's really what, what you want. Um, but I think that at the same time, just seeing a vehicle driving down the road is often something that can sell a vehicle for me, just seeing it, you know, even if it's someone else's car. Well, and it seems Ooh. like, it seems like that they literally, you. You could send a pair of shoes back pretty easily, but sending the car back is a little more difficult. I, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I guess, I, you know, I completely agree. I think that, you know, if you buy a washer or dryer, you probably go and look at them all, but you research it on Consumer Reports or whatever. Mm -hmm. You still want to see what it looks like in your house, but you go look at it before you buy it. You can buy everything online, but I think part of the question too, Lou, is that I, are we designing different 
I, I don't think so. I think that, you know, like Acura, for instance, is a performance brand and I, we're trying to be more emotional. So I think that, that that won't change. I think if anything, you better be more emotional so that when people actually go online or, or want to buy it, that they feel like they're, oh my gosh, what is that? I need to, I need to buy that. So I, I don't think that we're going to change our strategy to, you know, I, I think there's some strategy towards wellness and things like that in the interior, but, but I think styling wise or, or just, you know, your impulse buy, I, I think that we're going to stick to what we believe in and what our brand believes in. I, have I a, wish I'd thought about that before I bought my refrigerator online. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I, have a, I have an interesting little story to tell. As you might have uh, seen, we started our coach building program at the beginning of this year with the Bacala project. So 12 uh, uh, coach built uh, Bentleys um, for 12 customers being open to uh, invest 1.5 million pound on per car. And we wanted to show a show car uh, uh, in Geneva Motor Show. We all know Geneva Motor Show never happened. Every so uh, <laughs> yeah, we wanted to show obviously the, the, the object to our uh, customers who, are, who were interested. We got the car sold after the Geneva Motor Show. Nobody has seen them in real life. Uh, only through uh, digital meetings, we got them sold within one week. And we have a waiting list uh, of another 24 customers who want the car, but obviously are out of, out of uh, competition now. And we have been configurating and co-creating each individual car with the customer. Everything uh, online, everything uh, with Zoom or whatever video conference possibility. And it works out very well. And we do high-end data. We show the customer the data on the, on the computer. We want to ramp up an idea to um, deliver not only to the customer, but also to our board members uh, VR goggles soon in the next four weeks. So we can do our data reviews with uh, VR goggles. So it is possible. Nevertheless, I do agree with my colleagues the real thing, touch and feel, especially when you are talking also about the overall proportion or the, the materials in the interior, all the beautiful details, especially in a luxury product, that's something you need to see at the end of the day or better even in the beginning in real life. By the way, just one thing to add, Luan, is that, um, you know, one of the things people cannot see is the size of the vehicle and the proportions like Stefan was just talking about. You know, very few people have seen the new vehicle we are working on and most people actually do not really understand what the size of the vehicle is because, you know, nobody's ever seen it. So, of course, if you would look at a, maybe a new BMW 3 Series or Audi A4, you would sort of have an idea because you know how big the last one was. But if you come out with a vehicle that nobody has actually ever seen uh, before, then it's very hard for people to understand the size by looking at it uh, virtually. You've got to have to see it in reality. Right. It, uh, Andrew made the point that if it's already on the road, it's easier for people to understand what they are going to get. But, but an actual brand new vehicle is going to be a lot more difficult. But yeah. are you guys designing more for the future for lifestyle entertainment space as, as we go into the next uh, production vehicles? I, I guess I can start that one. I, I'm assuming you're talking about autonomous driving. Um, well, uh, Henrik is going electrification right away, but autonomous driving as well. Um, yeah. do, uh, are you thinking more along the, life, the lifestyle entertainment side of it instead of, yeah. and certainly if you're in China, then you definitely are. So yes, yeah, to, to speak to each one of those. Yeah, I think it's a choice, or at least, if, you know, you want the customer to have the choice or the, the driver to have the choice, whether they're going to be focused on the driving experience or focused on relaxation or communication or socialization, whatever they're doing. So I think in the future that we need to think about how we lay out the interiors. Best example I could give you is um, when we, we, you know, we have a, a multifunction controller in Cadillac for the screens. Once we started to put Super Cruise in, we noticed that people like to sit a little bit further back. They start to pay attention to the road, but they actually relax a little more. And so the controller wanted to come back a little bit to, to be still within an easy hand's reach. It's maybe the first kind of tiny step that I've seen towards 
rethinking the interior for an autonomous experience. But certainly the whole idea of, you know, what do you do when you're not driving becomes very, very important in, in the future. Yeah, right. absolutely. I, I completely agree. I think, you know, we're aiming at, as a performance brand, you know, obviously the first thing you think of is driving. Yeah. But if you're not driving, then then what is the experience you get? And I think that, you know, uh, performance could also be the the entertainment system. You know, we have ELS, you know, we, it, it could be the the HMI voice activated or I think to, to, to answer your question, well, I think it's ease of use and and designing towards the customer. Not I, you mentioned it, not having to. Um, you have to to be right up front with the the jog dollar or however you however you access your information we want to make sure that's seamless and safe but also entertaining um and i think that you know from a performance brand you know if you go full autonomy i've, I've always said that if i go full autonomy from a performance brand how do you do that and i always said well i'll have senna drive me to work or you know jackie stewart will drive me to the mall or something. So i think with autonomous you're able to to pick and choose. I, I mean, who said I have to go 40 miles an hour on the freeway with everybody else? I, I, I should pick somebody that can really drive and, and take me where I want to go. So that's, it's a little facetious, but I think that ultimately you want to design towards your brand and, and what is it, you know, we just had the, the TLX and the MDX come out during COVID. So we had no auto show either. So, I mean, literally it's, it's yeah. kind of like, an online press conference is really lame. I, I can just tell you right up front. But within it, we, we pretty much succeeded to get our point across and, and show it. But it's not like, uh, honestly, you know, selfishly, it's you guys. It's one of your peers that you're at the show with. And they come over and go, wow, that's really nice. Or I love that car or whatever it is. That's, that's half of the, the joy of what we do. And so we, we, we miss out on that a little bit. But, you know, when you're aiming at future product, you know, what does the customer want? What does COVID change the customer? I mean, I, for sure the, the health and wellness part of it, but I think they still see the vehicle as a sanctuary and, a, and an ability to, to get in there and not have to deal with COVID because you're, you're all alone in your car. So you better make it entertaining or, or, or fun to drive or whatever it is. Right. Yeah, I, I, you're a little bit different. You're, Stefan is a little bit different because you already pretty much um, designed for entertainment. There are very few cars that have a champagne holder in the back seat That's of the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as far as you look down to a glass of champagne is a good means of entertainment. Definitely, we have done this already. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I have to say, I mean, in the end of the day, what is important with a, a glass of champagne? Is it half empty or is it half full? And I would say, especially in a luxury brand like Bentley, um, talking about interiors, uh, even in an autonomous uh, phase of our life, uh, the glass is definitely half full. Just imagine we would have this meeting now and everybody would sit in an autonomous driven car uh, with all the luxury, with all the relaxation, it would be fantastic. I mean, I have now already, while I'm sitting in the car, with the help of my uh, uh, iPhone, I have, obviously without picture, I have a video, well, not video, but conference calls uh, where, we, where we are talking to each other. It would be great just to relax, sit in the seat, get driven by an autonomous pilot and have a video conference and talk to each other. It would be cool. Yes, yeah, so I, I think that I, I, I probably have a slightly different view on, on autonomy being here and having looked a lot of it uh, over the last, I would say, year. Um, I think we're much further away from full autonomy than we thought. Uh, I don't think it's around the corner, at least not cars without a steering wheel. And I think we're going to shift autonomy into being relevant for certain vehicles in certain situations. Um, and, and not necessarily think about it as a, a full autonomous vehicle all the time, anywhere. Um, and, and when it comes to design, I, I also think moving into electrification, fortunately, I think for all of us, I actually think design is going to become even more important in the future uh, because the differentiator between uh, the brands is not anymore going to be the engine sound and how smooth is your gear shift because these two things falls away. 
Uh, that's number one. Number two is we're going to see a fusion of software and and design, and specifically, of course, on the user interface. And I, I don't think anybody yet have hit it perfectly on a user interface, which is great because there's a lot of work to be done there. It's not enough just to put a giant screen in the car. There's a whole bunch of other things that I think uh, we, we need to think about. And, and I think we need to think about how do we uh, entertain people in an electric car versus uh, going back, if you think about a manual five-speed, you know, vehicle with a great engine sound and all that, that was became entertainment for all of us. And that's how we grew up being entertained by interaction with this mechanical device and mastering it. And now we're going into electric cars where everybody can go to zero to 60 in three seconds. And, you know, it's all of them are quiet and, you know, all of them are smooth. So what becomes now the entertainment as you operate this vehicle? And that's something we are thinking a lot about at the moment to introduce new things that haven't really existed before in a vehicle uh, to kind of get uh, people emotionally involved. And that, of course, is mainly on, on driving the vehicle in the interior. But I think exterior wise, I also believe that we're going to get a lot more radical with designs in the future. Uh, I think people... Uh, I've already started to sort of accept that, uh, you know, we, we don't have to have boring vehicles, even in, in some of the lower segments. Of course, in the high-end segments, it's always easier. Um, but I think design is, is going to be at the forefront. Uh, uh, and I still think in the future that, you know, if somebody walks up to a vehicle, they, they're going to want to like that vehicle or feel something. Uh, th there's no reason to buy an ugly vehicle in the future, whereas maybe in the past, there was more differentiators in other areas where in the future, uh, I think, again, design is, is going to take a much more leading role. So I'm pretty excited about that. Let me just, I have a couple examples. In fact, um, the map behind me is the DARPA Urban Challenge, and the first autonomous vehicle challenge. And the LIDAR technology there was so massive that it took the entire roof of the SUV. And Volvo has just come out with minority stake in Luminar technology, and they've just shared the roof line design that you can see on, uh, on the Zoom. And it's a mere bump on the top of the roof. And that's where I think of when I think of design and technology and how much uh, you have, we can travel in the future. And uh, just, I remember at Mercedes, there was uh, at the CES, they had seats that swiveled in and out so that you didn't actually have um, to, to think about getting in a car if you were older. How much of that design and technology will continue to influence every car that you design? I think it, it's always going to do that. I think though that what you've got on the screen right now, the original DAPA challenge and then the, um, the integration as it stands at Volvo, I'm looking forward to the next one, which is where you can't see it at all. Um, so I think what we, what we as designers want to do is basically make beautiful vehicles that can do whatever you need them to do. Um, I do think that it's deep customer insight and deep customer understanding that leads you to things like the seats um, that you mentioned at Volvo. And I think in the future that, um, you know, as, as um, we think more and more about people who aren't driving um, in electric vehicles where you have more flexibility than you've had ever before, I think it becomes kind of to the point that Henry made before, it becomes a differentiator. Yes. How much uh, is this? Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to, to add to what Andrew said. I totally agree. Um, the differentiators in the future will be, I think we all agree, very, very different. Uh, I think it is also the, the social hygiene, for example, mm. how much the cars are going to weigh, uh, because Weight is uh, contradicting a range, especially when you talk, of course, about electric cars. So we need clever solutions in the interior and all over the car. We need, uh, from the design uh, statement, we have to show this in the future, I believe, even with luxury cars. So we uh, fulfill a certain social hygiene. And this leads us definitely also in the subject of eth ethical uh, um, materials, sustainable uh, materials, uh, very short uh, supply uh, chains. 
I think this is some of the game changers in the future, which we have to look at as designer and play with these ideas and make something completely new out of it. Absolutely. Yeah, well, necessity is the form of innovation, right? I, I think, literally, I like the, the DARPA with the big, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I think that's an example of, of, you know, design driving innovation because we, we want that LIDAR. We want, you know, we want the autonomous car to have all of the, you know, cameras where they, they're located uh, aesthetically. And that will drive us to, to request it or force it. And then, you know, who knows? Some guy inventing the LIDAR is going, I don't care if it's up on the roof. It, it doesn't look bad to me, but it looks bad to us. And I think that's what will drive the, the public consumption will say, well, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. Or, wow, it's cool how they integrated that and, and formed the, the roof line around it or whatever it is. I think, you know, what Stefan said about, you know, ecology, that's, that's huge with sustainable materials. And, and yeah. you know, we, I know at Acura, we bought a, a, like three or four dead trees from Brazil and, and we use them in the cars. And, you know, we call it dead wood. It's like literally dead wood floating in water, whatever it is. But I, I think that kind of activity and the wellness you mentioned, Stefan, about, you know, are you going to put up, I think, uh, you know, do you put plastic up? You see Uber drivers with plastic and things. I, I don't know that we're going to go that far. I think we're going to have wellness through the HVAC system and things like that. And, and, and then wellness through lighting and things like that that can change your mood or or help you to cope with it. You know, I like what you said about having champagne in the back. I'll do that. But I, I, <laughs> I, I do need to mention that the glass, I'm a glass full, half full kind of guy, unless it's beer. And if the beer is half empty, it's half empty. I need more beer. That's pretty much where I'm at. But I, I think going forward, we're totally going to to aim at, you know, what if this, you know, this is a pandemic, but it could, you know, what's next? So if you start you know, imagining scenarios of good or bad or, or, you know, whatever the political landscape is, how do you do that? I think the political landscape now ecologically will move towards more sustainability for sure. Hmm. So sustainability and reduction of, uh, of weight, have you thought about 3D printing? Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think the, the issue we have with 3D printing is that it's difficult to make it something that is aesthetically pleasing. So we'll, we'll use it 3D printing in limited areas where you can see them. Where it's really a value, I think, is in the areas where you can't see, where you're looking for something that's functional um, and unique. So it may be that it's a performance variant of a vehicle or um, uh, even a regional variant that has different requirements where you have to build low volumes of a certain part. It's certainly an awesome technology. I mean, it's also a family of technologies or processes. Um, we've, we've played with a couple of areas where you can actually see the 3D printing, but it's more about telegraphing what the rest of the vehicle is about than it is about the part itself for us. Henrik, I've got the same question three times for you. Um, you have hinted at emotion about engineering milestones. Um, any updates on the release date? A lot of people are curious. So, you know, we right now we're only talking about the, the Fisker Ocean, which is our first vehicle. We kind of changed the strategy a while ago and, and decided to come out with the Emotional later. That will also be redesigned as that was a, a show car from a couple of years ago, but we step, definitely still want to come out with it. You know, we're trying to, to come, come in sort of uh, in, in areas of the segment where we can really be different. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we are trying to build in a lot of sustainability that may be uh, a little early for some companies or maybe a little expensive, but we, th we think and hope that we have some clientele that's willing to pay a little extra for that because we are early on. Um, and, and I think, you know, playing with these sustainable materials, recyclable materials, you also come up with some new, new ideas. Um, some of it, of course, is in its early stage because as we all know, we need automotive grade, etc. And because you can make a handbag out of something doesn't mean you can make a seat out of it that's going to last for 100,000 miles, uh, you know, and that, that's sort of the misconception, of course. So to actually put these sustainable materials in a vehicle is really difficult uh, and it'll take some time for the supply chain to, to get there. But, but I think coming out of COVID, I think um, 
people will be thinking different. Uh, and I think people are going to associate themselves with brands and design that are, are serious about the environment. And, and I think you can be serious with any type of vehicle, any size of vehicle. You know, our first vehicle is an SUV. And rather than saying, let's forbid SUVs, we said, well, why don't we make a sustainable SUV? Uh, yeah, of course, uh, the best is if everybody would drive a little hatchback, but that's not what everybody wants. So we have to find that way of, of designing products that people want and then improve them in the right direction. And, and I think that's, by the way, the great thing about the automotive industry, there's people want choice and there's room enough for a lot of different vehicles out there. Uh, I'm really excited about the future. I think the, uh, again, as I said, there's gonna be, we're gonna see, I think a design revolution as we move into electrification. You know, one of the things we are forced to do, most of us, uh, except maybe the guys over at Porsche is, you know, to sit people on top of a battery. And that fundamentally uh, changes the proportions of a vehicle. Uh, and, and, you know, we're sitting higher in the vehicles. Uh, we don't have an engine out in the front. We don't sit on the gas tank at the rear, so we don't need the typical overhangs. So I think there's a lot of excitement that can come out of, of, of those new type of proportions. And we are in such an infant stage where, you know, we're, we're just getting started. So uh, I, I'm, I'm expecting to see a, a kind of a revolution over the next five to seven years. And clearly, Henrik was our timekeeper because we are now out of time. But before we leave, I do want to say that there were some students that, ex that ex did design cars and all of you got to see them. And mm -hmm. we did pick one winner. The winner was Anki Ukiel. And it was from, he's the Advanced Interior Design Intern at GAC Research and Development. And he went to College for Creative Studies, Bachelor of Arts, and his field of study was the transportation design. So congratulations on Keith. And uh, thank you all, everyone, Jim. for, uh, for being here. And the future of design is in your hands. Thank you, Luan. Very yeah. good. Thank you, Lou. Thank you so much. And jumping in, we've 